Hey everyone, welcome back. We've got another lesson with lunch money. We are getting closer to the end of the story. Just four more lessons to go. Um, today we are starting with lesson eight and we have two chapters to read today. We have chapters 20 and 21. So we are going to get started right away. Our learning intentions. We are learning to um, analyze author's word choices so that we, we can discuss a text in detail. We know we're successful when we can define the word choice, define figurative language, and use the author's word choices to describe a story in detail. For foundational skills, you have the suffix I-O-N. And remember that adding the suffix I-O-N to a verb changes that word to a noun with the meaning of the act of blanking or the condition of being blank. So like adoption, extinction, illustration. So like, for example, illustration would be like the condition of being illustrated. Um, legislation, population, protection, and suggestions are some of the words that you have when we'll see in your practice read. For vocab, you have the word agenda. And so an agenda is a list of items to be discussed at a formal meeting. And so you can kind of think of an agenda like a list or maybe only like a calendar. That's what our picture is, where you can list things that are going to be discussed. And then we have the word pioneering. And pioneering means involving new ideas or methods. We have kind of our little light bulb moment here something that is kind of fresh and new. So again, we're going to get started right away with reading so we don't waste any time. Chapter 20 is called Agendas. So again, thinking about a formal list of things to do. It was about 12.30 on Wednesday afternoon, right in the middle of Mr. Z's preparation period. He was writing short equations on the board, one for every student in his next class. Mrs. Davenport appeared in the doorway of room 27 and said, if you have a minute, I'd like you to explain something for me. Mr. Z knew that voice. He turned around and saw the principal waving a sheet of blue paper. Sure, what's that, he asked. She took a few steps into the room. It's the agenda for tomorrow night's school committee meeting. And there's an item under new business, students and faculty advisor to propose new comic book club at Ashworth Intermediate School. Oh, said Mr. Z, that. I hadn't heard anything yet. I was hoping that the school committee wouldn't even consider the request, but it looks like they did. The math teacher felt his hands begin to sweat. Mrs. Davenport said, let me guess. The students are Greg Kenton and Mara Shaw and the faculty advisor is you, right? Mr. Z nodded. And I had planned to talk to you just as soon as I found out if the committee was going to accept the presentation because I didn't want to cause a stir, not if it wasn't necessary. Mrs. Davenport smiled at his choice of words. She waved the blue sheet again and said, and now it's necessary, so talk to me. Well, said Mr. Z, you know these two kids, both of them so smart, and they figured out that, this, that it's the school committee who sets the policy about selling things in schools. It was right there in your announcement. And they think their little comics are as good as some of the books that the kids can buy here at the school from the book club every month. So they want to make their case. And I sort of told them I'd help. That's all. Mrs. Davenport was still smiling faintly. You offered to help, even though you know my opinions on all of this. Mr. Z said, I, I didn't act exactly volunteer, but when they told me what they wanted to do, I guess I decided to stay involved, to try and represent the best interest of the school. Mrs. Davenport's eyebrows went up. Represent the best interest of the school? You didn't think I was already doing that? Mr. Z said, well, not exactly. The principal's eyebrows went up a notch higher. Mr. Z had been dreading this moment, but he knew what he had to say. He gulped and went on. I don't think there's anything wrong with comic books, with the good ones, that is. And the ones that these kids are, are making aren't bad, and they're definitely creative. And maybe other kids should get a, can a chance to read them. Mrs. Davenport nodded. Ah, I didn't know you'd become a reading expert. There was a long, awkward pause. Mr. Z practically held his breath, afraid to guess what was coming. When it came, he was completely surprised because Mrs. Davenport slowly shook her head from side to side and then began to chuckle, <laughs> a reading expert. Then she smiled broadly. Mr. Z began to breathe again. She said, well, Mr. Zenotopoulos, I thank you for your pioneering work as a reading specialist and also for keeping watch over our young tycoons. And I'll be there tomorrow night to hear the presentation. And who knows, I might just have an agenda of my own to represent the best interest of my school. And with that, she turned and left chuckling all the way back to her office. Remember pioneering, meaning like they're coming up with this great new idea. 
So it says, after Mrs. Davenport hears about the school committee presentation, she re refers to Greg and Mara as tycoons. What conclusions can you draw about why the author uses that word to describe Greg and Mara? So why does he call them tycoons? Do you guys know what a tycoon is? Tycoon is like someone that um, is, you know, kind of big and powerful and profitable in something. And so our young tycoons, like they're really trying to make lots of money and be big and um, powerful and profitable in the um, comic book industry. So she's calling them tycoons because she's like, you know, they're really trying to be big business people. And chapter 21, the question of money. Thursday afternoon was scraping along like a glacier. Greg looked at the clock again. Not even four minutes had passed. It was still almost the beginning of fifth period. Mrs. Chalmers was teaching them a new piece of music and she was working with the sopranos first. Then came the altos and then finally the ten tenors would get a turn. At this rate, the school day was going to drag on for another month, maybe two. Tonight was the meeting. Tonight was the night of the school committee meeting and Greg couldn't wait. He was eager to stand up and talk to the grown-ups, a whole crowd of them. He was going to state his case. He might even have an argument. That part was exciting to him. Greg was dying to see what everyone would think about the comic book club. But more than that, Greg wanted the whole thing to be over, finished, settled one way or the other. He wanted it to be over so he could think about something else. Because for a solid week now, he had been thinking about nothing but money. And during that week, money had become much more complicated. Until his big blow up with Mara, and then his run-ins with Mr. Z and Mrs. Davenport, the questions of money had been simple for Greg. In fact, it hadn't even been a question. Money was money and money was great. It was good to make it, good to have it, good to save it, and it was always good to want more and more and more of it. Money, simple. Also, Greg's attitude about money used to be private until he had started trying to sell chunky comics. How he had made his money was um, what he chose to do with it was nobody's business but his. And tonight, he was going to have to stand up in public and try and tell all these people why he ought to be allowed to sell his comics and make some money at school. It helped that Mara was in on the deal and Mr. Z too. But Greg knew they didn't think about money the way he did. They thought he was a nutcase, a money maniac, a moneyac. And tonight, what if everybody else thought, um, thought so too? And worse than that, what if it was actually true? Greg thought, maybe I really am a greedy little money grubber. Maybe I really don't care about anybody but myself. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Greg Kenton, the greediest, most selfish kid on earth. Greg looked at Mrs. Chalmers. She was going over and over the same 16 notes with the soprano, smiling, nodding, and playing the piano and singing along. It looked like hard work. And I know she doesn't make a lot of money, he thought. None of my teachers do. And that reminded Greg of his conversation with Mr. Z about other jobs. Greg knew Mr. Z could be making tons more money if he worked for a lab or an engineering company, but instead he was a math teacher. And that thing he'd said about his brother, the load paid doctor, for him, enough is enough. And ever since that conversation, Greg had thought about Mr. Z's toilet theory at least four times a day. And three days ago, Greg had heard on the evening news that Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, was giving away another $375 million for education in Africa. Super rich and giving his money away. And in the same news story, they told how Ted Turner, the man who started CNN, had given $1 billion to the United Nations. A billion! Money thoughts had been following him everywhere around the school, onto the soccer field, across town to his home, even into the bathroom. Greg couldn't get away from them. But if this slow motion school day would ever end, and if tonight's school committee meeting would ever arrive, maybe that could change. All right, guys. So today we are focusing on word choice. And I'm going to start with a quote for you from Andrew Clements, the author of our story. He says, remember that everything that happens in a book happens on purpose. The words did not just land on the page that way by chance. As you read a book, you are looking at thousands and thousands of decisions someone made. And if you begin to think like a writer, you may be able to discover why a particular sentence was written in that particular way. And so that's really what we're focusing on today is why did Andrew Clements write them, um, put the words on the page in the way that he did? Why did he choose to describe things in the way that he did? So word choice can include the use of figurative language like similes and metaphors. So a simile is a comparison of two unlike things using the words like or as. So like, for example, it says her reflexes were as quick as a cat. So really they're comparing their reflexes to a cat and the cat's speed. 
A metaphor uses the word is to say that one thing is something else. So like Mrs. Sanborn is a bear when she's angry. So again, she's saying that she is a bear. We know that Mrs. Sanborn is not actually a bear, but we could say she's a bear when she is angry. So we are going to look back at the text today um, to find some similes and metaphors in the text. So it says in the very first sentence here, Thursday afternoon was scraping along like a glacier. Is Thursday afternoon actually a glacier? No, of course not. But they're comparing how the day is going to the speed of a glacier. And we know that glaciers move extremely slowly. Then it continues on to say that Greg looked at the clock again. Not even four minutes had passed. So that's really telling us how slowly time is moving for Greg. And then as we keep reading, we can find another one where it says, at this rate, the school day was going to drag on for another month, maybe two. So again, is it actually going to drag on for that long? Of course not. But Greg feels like time is going so slow. So right now, when I'm thinking about the author, Andrew Clements, he's really trying to show us how like, anxious Greg is for the evening because remember you know when you're excited for something sometimes time seems to slow down so time has really slowed down for Greg here and then it says but if this slow motion school day would ever end and if tonight's committee school so again they're calling it a slow motion school day so it's going so slow nothing's ever going to happen so again Andrew Clements he's really trying to get you to feel how Greg is feeling with the time is just going so slow because he's so nervous, anxious, and excited for that school committee meeting tonight. All right, so that's where we're going to stop for today. Remember that we are learning to analyze the author's word choices. That way we can discuss a text in detail. Uh, we need to define word choice. So we did that by thinking about um, Andrew Clement says that, remember, an author puts those page words on the page for a reason. So word choice is thinking about why did the author choose to use those words? check. And then define figurative language. So remember, figurative language um, includes similes and metaphors. And we saw a couple of those in our text. Um, but that's um, when they don't say exactly what they mean. Check. And then use the author's word choices to describe a story in detail. So in this case, thinking about how slowly this day is really going for Greg. And we're going to explore more of this tomorrow. Check. All right. And then lastly, for your reading response, you have a short paragraph to read. And I want you to think about what does this tell you about Mrs. Chalmers? All right, that is all for today. Have a wonderful day. Be kind to one another and I will see you guys next time. Bye.